and I predicted that I would intercept a pass. And lo and behold, I intercepted the pass and run it in for a touchdown. So that was probably one of my biggest memories. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Club 46. It's the program where we sit down with a current or former great Cleveland Brown. And today I am thrilled to be joined by the former safety of the Cleveland Browns. He was three times a pro bowler, Tom Darden. Tom, thanks for joining us on Club 46. How are you? I'm doing well, Jay. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Especially a fellow Sandusky. Absolutely. We have, we have common bonds. We're going to talk about Sandusky in your, in your early years, but I like to start with each guest by asking for their favorite memory during their years as a Cleveland Brown. What was, what's your biggest memory, your most fond memory? I don't know if I can quantify it to one specific memory. Say. I mean, there, there was quite a few that stick out, especially, you know, back then when you're around the guys as much as we were around each other, you become quite close to guys. So there was always stories and things happening with guys, but, as far as on the field memories, I, I guess the, the Dallas game in Cleveland, Monday night, over 80,000 screaming crazy fans <laughs> on the lake, uh, Cosell's doing Monday night. I had just had an interview with Cosell the night before on my show with, uh, at WMMS, and I predicted that I would intercept the pass. And lo and behold, I intercepted a pass and run it in for a touchdown. The first quarter fireworks were capped by all pro safety Tom Darton, who snapped Roger Starbuck's string of 150 passes without a theft. That was probably one of my biggest memories. Wow. Yeah. So what was Howard's reaction when you told him that you were going to intercept the pass? Well, according to... You know, my friends who were listening and watching the game, he said that uh, he had done an interview with me the night before, and uh, I had predicted that I would intercept the pass, and Howard <laughs> obviously was a little fanatic, right? I can almost hear Howard saying those very words right now. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to come back, and we're going to talk about uh, talk at length about your time with the Cleveland Browns. but. Now I want to go back to the beginning, to those early years. Tom Darden growing up in Sandusky, Ohio, on the lake, very much in Cleveland Browns territory. What was your childhood like growing up in Sandusky? My father worked at Aluminum Magnesium. My mother and father married early. Um, and uh, I remember my mother from a big family. So we were always around a lot of family members. And back then, Sandusky was a pretty segregated town. And we lived on the south side of Sandusky in a all black community. Uh, actually, it was a, a development that was completed right after World War II. And they were, it was called the projects, but not, nothing like the projects you think of today. Sure. Uh, there were four, four row houses and one was across from each other and it actually went in front of the stadium. So, I mean, I could walk. Yeah, is, was that called MacArthur it, Park? It was, it was next to MacArthur Park. It was actually, yes. MacArthur okay, so Park was actually two sections. There was one section that was white and one section that was black. I didn't know that. I never yes. knew that, Tom. Yes. And interesting was, enough, I, I, had to, I had to walk through uh, the white section to get to school, mill school, uh, there was significantly a number of fights all the time. Right? I can imagine. I can imagine. So growing up in Sandusky, how, how were you led to sports? What was your first, first um, brush with playing sports? Oh, well, see, my father uh, played, you know, he was from Georgia originally, moved to Sandusky, when he was in uh, his junior year of high school, he wasn't allowed to play uh, football at Sandusky High. 
nor basketball. Wow. Actually, back then, blacks could not swim in the swimming pool in Sandusky High School. Um, wow. But my father was always motivated through sports. So he had a softball team that ended up playing in a, a, a World Series softball tournament in 1957, I think it was. Wow. But my father was always in the sport. So I remember vividly at his job, he made a plate for me and he put the plate out and he would have me pitch to him and try to make the ball come across the plate. So wow. that's how I got my start at pitching was uh, working with him. So baseball was your first love? Initially, baseball was my love. Um, I started playing baseball at the age of seven. Um, actually, one of the things that occurred, I had an article written in the Illyria Chronicle when I was nine years of age because I pitched one game left-handed and right-handed. Is that um, true? Yes, very true. Um, how were you I, able to throw, how are you ambidextrous? Did you, have you always been that way or did you teach yourself? I was always that way. And uh, I'm still, they, they say I'm confused because I throw left-handed, I kick left-footed, I bat right-handed, I shoot a basketball right-handed, well, or left-handed, um, and I eat with my left hand, but I can eat with my right, but predominantly with my left. Um, wow. I, I write left-handed. So they, in the neighborhood, they call me a confused kid. Right? <laughs> so at nine years old, you throw a game left-handed and right-handed. How did you even come to know that you could throw well left-handed well I, I originally pitched left-handed so okay left-handed pitcher i just automatically when things would you know you're horsing around i would throw with either hand well lo and behold when i get bit by bugs i swell so i got bit on the hand by a mosquito i swelled so they weren't sure that i was going to be able to pitch the next day we get out to the ballpark and this was I was in, uh, huh? I was in Babe Ruth League at that time. It wasn't Little League; it was Babe Ruth League. Right. So I was 12, 13 years of age, and um, over in uh, uh, for Monroe, Monroe Park, by okay. Monroe uh, Middle School. I know it well. So I pitched, and I just couldn't hold the ball with my left hand. And my father said, "You think you can throw the ball right hand?" And I said, "Sure." So I finished the game right handed, and we actually won the game. <laughs> Which game did you pitch better with, left or the right? Oh, I pitched better with my left, undoubtedly. Yeah. Tom, could you imagine the value of a pitcher today that could pitch equally as well, left and right handed? The think about days rest and the number of innings that pitcher would be able to eat. You could command two big league salaries if you could do that today. I, I don't even want to think about that, Jay. I don't, I, I don't even have comprehension with the sums of contracts today's world. It's, it's unbelievable. Yeah, they're, it's just crazy numbers. So, Tom. Just to give you an example before you sure. go to the next point. I had a tryout with the Indians. And Did you? That was, that was, my, that was my, my, my goal in life was to play for the Indians. Wow. And, um they wanted to sign me for, I think it was $12,000. Wow. Now, was this before Michigan or at, or were you already at Michigan? Oh, uh, no, I was in uh, high school then. I was in, um, I played, I played baseball from seven to 18 every summer. So even when I went to Michigan, I came home and played baseball in the, um, what do they call that league after you? American Legion? American Legion, thank you. Uh, I also played, played the American Legion post-83. Good for you. Um, so let me ask you this. At what point, Tom, were you introduced to football? Uh, in the sixth grade at Mill School, we had a football team. And because I was, you know, I was always playing ball, whether it was spring, summer, or fall, so in the neighborhood so we all went out and um 
I played halfback on the sixth grade team at middle school. That was my first organized football game. And was it, was it instant love? No, did not like it. <laughs> I did not like it because I was getting hit all the time, right? <laughs> I didn't realize it until, actually, I didn't move from offense to defense until I was a freshman in high school. Oh, really? Was it because yeah. you, did, you got sick and tired of getting hit on every play? There you go. As a, in the seventh <laughs> grade, uh, a gentleman by the name of Tony Manafo, uh, who actually coached at Huron. I was going to uh, say, that's a Huron name. I know it well. Yep. He put me at, his, at quarterback. So I was a left-handed, black quarterback, 19, that would have been 60, 59, wow. something like that. And uh, I could run the ball and, and do the options. I just couldn't throw. <laughs> so, and you didn't throw the ball that much back then anyway. So once football was introduced, you didn't like this whole idea of being hit. So I'm guessing baseball was still your favorite. At what point, Tom, did you realize that your future was probably going to be football and not baseball? My father came to me. Uh, I can't remember exactly when he did or what age I was, but he said to me, look, he said, if you want to go to college, you got to figure out a way to pay for it or get it paid for because we can't afford to send you to college. And I took that to heart because I wanted to get away from our neighborhood. I wanted to better myself as I thought. And the only way I could do that was go to college. So I thought, how am I going to get a scholarship to play? So as I developed um, in ninth grade, I was moved to wide receiver and defensive back. Uh, Gene Kidwell was my coach. who ended up becoming remember Gene. one of the uh, high school coaches. And he sort of took me under his wing. And uh, I became a defensive back, a guy by the name of Milan Bulatic. Uh, who was also on that? Our high school coaching staff had about five guys who ended up becoming head coaches somewhere, uh, high school and college. Wow. Actually, Mike Currents, who ended up being uh, head coach at Maslin, was one of our coaches. Uh, Bob Seaman, who ended up being a coach at Maslin and on to uh, uh, that school that had the, the, the plane accident when they. Uh, Wow, oh, back in the Marshall. 60s. Marshall, thank you. And um, so, we had, I mean, we had great coaches. We had great coaches. So I started learning how to play the secondary as a freshman in high school. And I enjoyed it. I wasn't getting hit. Had an opportunity to hit other people. Um, I loved it. So I was a wide receiver and a defensive back. Back then, you played both ways. So um, by the time I'm a sophomore in high school, uh, Coach Seaman comes to, I'm trying to think if Kidwell was our coach. I can't remember who was our head coach, but uh, uh, the freshman coach, and he says, I'm sorry, the sophomore coach, he says, I want uh, Tom Darden and Eddie Williams, who was a running back uh, in my class, who – Obviously, he was a great running back. I think he was the state best running back in 1968. He had us dress varsity. So my sophomore year, I played uh, on the, the 10th grade team, and I dressed for the varsity team, which wow. became an undefeated team and uh, AAA state champions in Ohio. So my I remember. Kid, I remember the sign that used to hang in town. Oh yeah, oh yeah, that's right. And we had a parade, and I mean, so really, football started, and I guess the benefits of of success really started coming at that point. And so that's what started me thinking that maybe football might be the way that I could get a scholarship and pay for my college education. Tom, was Earl Bruce ever part of the Sandusky staff? It seems to me that at some point he was. He was the head coach 61, 62. And um, after he left, he left to go to Massillon. We had three coaches 
leave Sandusky High School, go to Maslin as high school coaches. First was Earl Bruce, then Bob Seaman, and then Mike Currents. So wow. there were three, yeah, we had three guys that leave. And, and it was interesting because we would scrimmage Maslin in the summer. We never played each other during the fall, but we scrimmaged each other. And my two years, we beat them in the scrimmage. Wow. Yeah, Sandusky's football used to be a powerhouse. And the old battles with Fremont Ross and, and Lorraine yep. Admiral King, that yep. old, I guess it was the Buckeye Conference, right? It was the Buckeye Conference, that's right. That, that was loaded with talent. Yes, it, it, we like to think of it as the second best conference in the state of Ohio during those years. You had the, uh, I think they called it the All Ohio or the Ohio, I can't remember the name of it, but you had Maslin, Kent McKinley. Um, they had one school in uh, uh, Niles, Niles McKinley yep. at that time. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, oh, what was, there, were, there were like six or seven teams that were the best high school football teams in the state of Ohio. But we felt very comfortable that we could hold our own with those guys. Those were great years. So, Tom, at what point in high school did you start receiving a lot of attention from college coaches? It started around my junior year. We yeah. were number one in the state my sophomore year. We were number three my junior year. We were 10 and 0 my sophomore year. We were 10 and 0 my, my junior year. Wow. And we were 9 and 1 my senior year. Uh, when we lost that game, so I guess I'm, I'm, I'm going off the script here a little bit, but my junior year, I played quarterback. And, um, I think I made second team all conference. So letters started coming in at that time. Um, then my Were senior you? year, obviously. Well, no, my senior year, I was right, I got to tell you this story. So in the summer, Mike Curtis was the guy that first got me to start lifting weights. And that happened the summer of my sophomore year in high school. So we go through the sophomore year, the junior year. The summer of my senior year, um, we had our middle linebacker break his leg in the scrimmage against Mast. So they come to me, Mike Kearns came to me and said, look, we need you to play middle linebacker. I said, wow. what? <laughs> <laughs> now, you got, I was a late bloomer. So I was 173 pounds as a defensive back. And, you know, guys from Elyria, Lorraine, Fremont, those offensive linemen were 220, 230, and I'm 173 pounds. So I got wow. to take on those kind of blockers. Most of the time I ran around them or I duped <laughs> them, but uh, I had to meet them sometimes face to face. And there was no doubt in my mind that playing middle linebacker my senior year made me tougher, made me a better football player. Yeah, I can only imagine. So Michigan's in heavy on you. What are some of the other schools? I imagine most of the Big Tens were, were on you as well. Did Ohio State show interest? Ohio State recruited me, and that, that was one of the reasons why I didn't go to Ohio State, was Woody wanted me to play linebacker. Down in really? Columbus. Well, he had, you know, he had this uh, Oklahoma defense where you had um, um, uh, a middle linebacker, outside line, two outside. No, it wasn't a 4-3. It was, uh, you had two linebackers, and you had defensive ends that would drop off into coverage as, as linebackers. And they wanted me to play that off-end linebacker because they had a guy, and I can't remember his name, but he was – he wasn't that big, he was slim, but he was fast and he was quick. And he played that position very well for Columbus, for Ohio State and Woody. So when I went down for my visit, uh, my parents were with me. We go into uh, the office and Woody's trying to tell me, 
see, Tom, here you are, you know, you're number one on our list. What he didn't realize was that prior to going in the office, uh, my parents and I were sitting out. I was walking around and saw that they erased my name lower in the, in the, on the board and moved me to the top of the board before we all came into his office. So I and knew that right was then it. I you, at that point, I wasn't you, going to school there. At that point, you said, I'm not coming here, essentially. I'm not going there, no. I'm not going there. <laughs> that sounds like an old Woody Hayes trick. Oh, yeah, it was definitely a good a good trick. And it, it worked most of the time. If I hadn't been walking around, I probably would have fell for it, too. <laughs> so what was, what was the interaction between Bo and Woody? How were the two different? They weren't very much. They weren't different too much. Um, um, I, I don't know Woody's history as well as I know Bo's history. Um, but, uh, well, actually, Bo played for Woody. Bo coached with Woody. Um, so Bo had learned how to formulate defenses. His, his strength was offensive linemen, and he knew how to uh, develop offensive linemen. So by the time he came to us, well, I knew Bo when he was at Miami of Ohio, but um, uh, Woody and Bo were very similar. So I guess that's all I can say. They both felt if you pass the ball, two things could happen and only three things could happen and two yeah. of them were bad, right? <laughs> yeah. The three yards in a cloud of dust philosophy. That's right. So, Tom, I always – I used to – when I would watch the, uh, the Browns game as a very young kid, and they would put your school up. I always used to think, how did a kid from Sandusky get away to Michigan? How was it that you finally said, that's where I'm going, Ann Arbor? Well, there were, there were a number of factors. Uh, one, my father said, look, there's no reason for you to go all around the country looking at these schools. I had offers from Texas. I had offers from um, – None from the deep south, but from Tennessee, I had offers. At that time, most guys didn't get recruited to the east. Um, we only had one guy that came, uh, I think, from – he was from – I can't remember, but he was a quarterback, black quarterback, ended up in our year being the quarterback out in uh, USC. But um, – so most of the – the recruiting was done regionally. And um, my father said, look, forget about those other schools. You need to pick three schools that you really like, and then we'll go visit those three schools. So my schools that I picked to go visit were Ohio State, Michigan, and Northwestern. Northwestern was coached at that time by Alex Agassi. And Alex Agassi was a great guy. I just really liked him. Um, the biggest problem when I went to visit Northwestern, they had three blacks on the team at the time. At Michigan, they had four. Um, they had more. They had more in Columbus. Um, but what what really sold the Darden family on Michigan was Bump Elliott. Bump Elliott came to my house, and he was just, um, he was a gentleman personified. I mean, he dressed nice, natty dresser, he spoke good English. That was, that was the other thing. Woody came to our house, and when Woody would start talking football, he'd get excited. And he'd start <laughs> frothing at the mouth, and then he started cursing. And Ooh. you just don't do that in my, house, my father's house. And when he cursed in our house, that was it for my father. He didn't want me to play for Woody. So Bump was um, just class personified. And when I went up to Ann Arbor to visit, it's just amazing how things work. We ended up having seven black guys as um, uh, 
tendered athletes on the football team in 1968. When I went up there, all seven of us were at the campus at the same time. We all got to know each other at the same time. And then once we committed, we all got together. We ended up living together in the last two years of our college career. But there were seven of us, and that was the most blacks that had come to Michigan and played football in its history. Do you think that was by design by Bo? No, because Bo didn't come, Bo didn't come to us until uh, winter of 1968. So Bump got, when 1968, Ohio State beats Michigan 52 to 14, 50 to 14. That was, I mean, that was plastered everywhere when we got there, 50 to 14. I remember watching it in Chrysler Arena and I just couldn't believe what it, what had happened. But the program had gotten to the point where, at Michigan, where, you know, to be honest with you, there was a lack of discipline. Um, guys just were not dedicated to football. Um, we had a lot of smart guys. They, were, they had other aspirations. Um, you still had some guys on that team that were great players like Deardorff, uh, Ron Johnson, um, just to name a couple other guys, George Huey, some of the other guys that ended up playing college ball or coaching college ball. Um, but we didn't have a lot of them. So when we came in our class in 1968, our class, by the time we graduated from that class at Michigan, uh, a number of things occurred. We were getting 100,000 fans every game instead of 100,000 fans at Michigan State and Ohio State. Uh, we had um, 11 guys get drafted into the NFL, probably the most that they had ever had. Uh, we, had we had four All-Americans on that team. We had uh, three first-round picks on that team. We had... Uh, we, we won 30, I think it was 34 games, and we lost three. Wow. So we, we had a pretty good career. So how would you characterize your, your time at Michigan? Best time of my life. Was it? If I, had, if I had to put a statement on it, it was the best time of my life because I grew up, I was a very – uh, sheltered, I think, um, high school kid um, coming from the, the south side of, of Sandusky. That's where I stayed most of the time. I never ventured out much until I got to high school. Um, also, being from Sandusky, I was, I was very sheltered, I think. Uh, when I got to Ann Arbor, um, I experienced, I mean, I experienced the first um, Protest. Well, it really, really wasn't a protest. I was a freshman um, going into my sophomore year, and I stayed up on campus th that summer because I I, uh, I found two the second semester of my freshman year I found out how to play pool, and me and the guy on the team we stayed up to midnight every night after uh, you know you had uh, what do they call it. When you had bump or bump made you go to um, for after after dinner until eight o'clock, you had to go study, table. study hall, study hall, study time. Yeah, so we had two hours of that. So from the time it ended to midnight every night, we played pool. Wow. So needless to say, my my grades suffered, and <laughs> I, had, I had to go back. My father was not pleased either. Um, I had to go back that summer and take summer classes so that I made sure there was no question with intercollegiate athletics about my standing. So when I stayed up there, I lived in the beta house in the summertime. Now here I'm a freshman going into my sophomore year. I'm living in this house with 
juniors and seniors. Needless to say, it was an interesting summer. But <laughs> the first thing was there was these hippies. Back then, it was the hippies, right? Sure. So the hippies were coming out of the union, and they just took over the streets. And police were called. Um, they didn't arrest anyone. They just monitored. And I mean, they were doing all kinds of things in that street. And here I am, a little kid from Sadusky. I was freaked out. I was thoroughly freaked out. I mean, what is going on here? Right? So that was my first uh, worldly experience. And during that, uh, yeah, my fall of my freshman year, we had Central Campus had a, a diag where all supposedly the four corners went out to all parts of the uh, the campus. And we had nuclear proliferation people come. We had uh, civil rights people come. We, I mean, we had all kinds of speakers that would get up and speak for free. I mean, some of the national, no, nationally known speakers I saw for free in uh, the summer of my freshman year or the fall of my freshman year, the summer leading to my sophomore year, right there on the middle of campus. Wow. And it was, just, it was just amazing. So on the field, um, you're growing as well in leaps and bounds. You're a two-time first-team All-American. Your, your final year, you make first-team All-American. You're a two-time Big Ten, All-Big Ten. Your senior year, you, you're a first-team All-American. Some of your uh, records are still among the best at Michigan, your return yardage and, and some of your interception marks. What was it like as you're figuring out that you're going to transition from the college game to the pro game, knowing that you're going to be a, a, a very high draft pick? Well, I did not know that at first. Really? Um, yeah. Back then, um, it wasn't a given that you were going to the National Football League to play football. Um, back then, um, that, wasn't the, that wasn't the first primary goal. Um, Bo had, and I think about it now, uh, Bo had um, influenced our minds enough that solely you thought about what was best for the team. So in doing that, all the way through, I never thought about individual awards. I never thought about individual pursuits. It was all about what the team was doing. And that didn't really occur to me until we got beat in the Rose Bowl by Stanford my senior year. Uh, that was the worst defeat I had ever witnessed at that time. And I didn't know what I, I – I was just so upset. And then we went to – there was four, four, four of us, I think, went to the Hula Bowl. So we left California, flew to Hawaii, and we were still upset when we were in Hawaii playing in the Hula Bowl. But we said, okay, look, college is over. We got to start thinking about what we're going to do in this game, this NFL game. So that was the first time I started thinking about preparing myself mentally and physically uh, to play in the National Football League. So that's January of 1972. Right. So what was your pre-draft and your draft day experience like? Because today we see all the hoopla and the cameras and everybody's at the draft site and ESPN and the NFL Network. It's a huge deal. But what was it like on draft day in 1972? <laughs> well, what it was, was you sat around, you know, we lived in this house, seven of us, four of us. Well, five of us got drafted. One went as an undrafted free agent. And um, we sat by the phone. And so waited. we did classes that day. We sat by the phone. And we had Sports Illustrated came to our house because they knew we were going to have at least 
two or three guys drafted in the first round. So they did an article on us uh, that day, and, and we were sitting there waiting for the call. And all you did was you get a call from the team, say, you know, Tom, we just drafted you uh, uh, here in Cleveland. Uh, I was the 18th pick in the first round. Uh, to be honest with you, I thought I was going to San Francisco because San Francisco said they wanted me, and they picked the 17th pick. And I didn't go to Frisco, uh, but I came to Cleveland, which you know was kind of ironic, coming from Ohio, being from Sandusky to get drafted by uh, the Cleveland Browns, where I used to. My father would take me up there to watch the games and what they called a dog pile. We used to sit in those seats for a couple of bucks, you know, 250, something like that, you know. Sure. You can't even get a hot dog for 250 down. Can't park your car, can't get a beverage, <laughs> can't get anything for 250. <laughs> so Tom, what's what's your immediate thought that you're going to stay in the Midwest and really essentially you're going home? It was a true it, it was a tremendous it didn't really hit me to be honest with you uh it didn't really hit me until I got to Cleveland. You know, I went to the All-Star game in Chicago, played against the Cowboys, um, who were the national champs, had a pretty good game. Uh, I realized that I could play with those guys, although uh, Bob Hayes uh, kept me very humble because one time I had to uh, check him one-on-one, and he just blew right by me. I think he went past me so fast, I didn't even lay a hand on him. But unfortunately, <laughs> Staubach couldn't get the ball to him. So, we Tom, lost. tell me about that game. They, they used to do that every year, right? They would get the college all-stars to play the champion from the AFL, was it? No. Um, at that time, let's see. The league finally merged. NFL became AFC, NFC. NFC, in okay. 1971. So it was the Super Bowl champions playing a game against college all stars. Yep. And it was. I can't imagine that happening today. It was. It was the biggest honor of my football career, to be honest with you. It was the biggest honor because that gave me the confidence to know that I could play in the NFL. Uh, we went to um, Northwestern's campus, and we practiced. We, we stayed there four weeks. I had uh, the Nebraska staff was our coach, and Willie Davis was also, who played for the Packers at that time, right. was one of our coaches. Wow. And I got to know him. That was probably the biggest gift I got out of playing that game was my relationship with Willie Davis. Um, but it, it, we practiced, well, we had two days, like, like everything else, you know, we practiced a lot and, uh, uh, it was a thrill to play in that game and they beat us 20 to 14, but I, I hate to say this, but Jerry Taggy was our quarterback. And if we had had a pro type quarterback, it might've been a little different, but uh, you know, coming coming from that time, the eye was the formation. They ran, you know, power running and and option play. That was the two things. And you threw the ball if you had to. Sure, right. So you're drafted by the Browns. Um, what was that first training camp like for you? Scared. Um, I went to Cleveland. Came from Chicago. They were already in camp uh, because the game was played in July, and uh, they had already been in camp. So uh, Bob Nussbaum came to Chicago the night of the game. I packed all my stuff, and he escorted me from Chicago to Hiram for training camp. And I'll never forget Hiram because. It was so hot in those dormitories. It was so hot in um, practice. I mean, we had guys passing out sometimes in training camp because it would be so hot, and the humidity would be so be as high as the temperature. Uh, 
but, but when I came, um, they immediately, I come there, they were in uh, practice. I think one day I didn't have to practice. Then the next day I got fitted for all my gear and stuff and I go out to practice. And Richie McCabe was the uh, secondary coach, um, probably the best teacher that I had as a coach in the secondary. Um, he was the one that, cause at Michigan during that time, we didn't play a lot of man-to-man uh, -man coverage, but I had to cover man often as a safety on blitzes and whatnot. So when I got to Cleveland, I had to learn how to play one-on-one man-to-man coverage. And uh, uh, Richie McCabe had the guys out in Oakland, and he was the one that instituted the man-for-man -man coverage for the Oakland Raiders. So he was, he was a great teacher. Do you have one memory from your first training camp that stands out? Uh, not really. Uh, I just remember that we had, we did those board drills, man. Oh, oh. You had a board down and you laid down, the guy had the ball on one end and you on the other end. You had to get up and keep your feet off the board and make and form a, a form tackle on the guy that was running the ball. And wow. Yeah, that that was that was a hard drill. And then we had the uh well I think the biggest thing I remember about that camp was after practice, after the second practice it from uh one, what was it, one thirty, two o'clock? to 3.30 or 4 o'clock, something like that, we practiced. And then we had to be back for dinner at like 6. So we had two hours, hour and a half of free time. And what I remember is following the guys on a trail from Hiram to this town to the nearest bar. And <laughs> that's when I learned how to drink beer, OK? <laughs> We went to that place after practice, after that second practice, and I never seen so many pictures of beer guzzled so quickly in all my life. Right? <laughs> Hydration. Hydration, that's right. Do you have any advice? What, what would you tell young rookies as they're getting set for their first training camps today? See, it's so much different today in that, number one, they don't hit. Um, but probably the biggest thing is, is the mental approach. Um, you know, now guys, you know, guys are coming in now, at least they seem from the interviews and things that I've heard, um, they are integral part of the team. You know, when I came, I didn't know I was going to start. I, I, I had hoped I was going to start and I was going to work my tail off to prove that I should be starting. But I didn't know it, and, and and even starting, I still they the veterans on that team, the Gene Hickerson's, the um, uh, uh, Walter Johnson's, the uh, Leroy Kelly's, the uh, uh, geez, I don't know, there were a number of guys still from that 1964 team. Sure. That were, in the, at the end of their career on, on my first training camp. And those guys talked to me. They talked to me about what it's like to play in the league. And they talked to me about some of the things that you go through, and uh, especially um, uh, during that time, because, you know, integration was probably still trying to become the, the, the issue. Uh, so, um, there was, and there was divisions on the team. There were black, there were white, there were guys that went both, could go to either side, not many, but there were. Uh, and trying to navigate those things were, were difficult, but with the help of those older guys, you know, I found my way, you know. So I, I would tell guys today, Make sure that you 
get a chance to meet and, and, and interact with the older guys, try to become as much of a part of the organization and, and the team as you can. But don't think that you are, you know, best thing since sliced bread. Uh, <laughs> right. Tom, in that, your years with the Browns from 72 to 81, did you see that racial division improve during your time? Not really. Not really. really. It was always a division. It was always – and, you know, you had situations where, like, like our offensive line was all white most of the time. I mean, there were some black guys in, interspersed throughout my tenure there, but most of the time – the offensive line was all white, and they hung together. Uh, the defensive backs were all black. They hung together. Um, that, so really there was some um, – I wouldn't say that it was disharmony, but there was not an integral uh, – how do I put it? There was not an integral uh, – situation where both parties were together. We had to be together on the field. We had to be together. But once we got off the field, there was separation. I know it's probably still bitter for you to talk about this, um, but the Raiders playoff game in oh. the – I know. Just about anybody that played on that team, when I bring it up, I get the same reaction. What do you most remember about that game? No more things. One, it was just so cold. It was so cold. Actually went out with my cleats and warm up, came back in and jumped into tennis shoes uh, because the field was frozen. You could not have worn cleats on that field while wow. been able to change direction at all. So I ended up wearing tennis shoes to play in that game. Uh, the second thing I and I the second thing I remember was that it was so cold on the sidelines when you came out of the game and you had to sit for the while the offense was out there. I don't know how anybody could have caught the ball with the ball. The ball was like a brick, so I don't know how they caught the ball. Um, the other thing I remember was that <clears throat> our defense played very well, and our defense. I felt like we were controlling the game. Our defense was. They, they couldn't do much against us at all. But our offense was sputtering and had problems. And I remember wondering why we didn't kick the field goal a couple of times. Because if we didn't kick field goals, we win that game. Hadn't, hadn't they, John they, missed a couple? I couldn't remember if he had missed a couple, but one end supposedly was more frozen than the other. The other end, the end with the uh, infield end, where you know it was dirt, was less frozen than the other end that had grass. Sure. And I think that's why Sam made the decision not to kick the field goal on that end uh, because it was grass and it was probably frozen. What What do you remember about Red Right '88? I'm sure you're standing at this point on the sidelines watching, hoping like all of us. What do you most remember about that play? Um, the only thing I remember, I couldn't even see what was going on, actually, because usually I sat down, I had a chair. There was no, at, at that time, we just had a straight bench. So there was no backrest on the straight benches. Well, I figured out how to get a chair because there were two reporters that would use these two chairs at the end of our area. And I would sit in one of those chairs. One of the guys would let me sit there. And that's the only place that I could get a backrest to be able to really sit and, and relax uh, while I was off the field. So I was away from most of the guys most of the time because those two chairs were at the end of the, uh, you know, whatever mat they had down. Uh, so I, I didn't know what was going on uh, until, you know, we saw the dejection of everybody. Uh, so 
you know, all I could remember was that we had to get the ball back. I couldn't remember how much time was left, but um, I knew we had to get the ball back. Do you remember Sam's message to you guys as a group when the game was over? No, I don't. I do not. And uh, to be honest with you, I think I totally blacked out that whole thing. Really? Yeah, because I knew it was the best opportunity for me to – the only championship team that I ever played on – I mean, we won divisional titles, the Central Division. Uh, I won uh, Big Ten titles, but I never, and you know, obviously in college, you didn't have playoffs. I lost both Rose Bowls. Um, so really, the only championship team I had was my sophomore year in high school as a member, and I wasn't an integral part of that team, that won the state championship in Ohio in 1966. That was the closest thing I had to being in a championship situation. Uh, we knew that if we won that game, pretty much we could beat the Chargers, who we would have had to have played the following week out in warm weather. So we were, I mean, we were just devastated. We were just, every guy on that defense was just devastated. And I recall I was so cold. I just stayed in the shower as long as I could. I didn't really have much to say to the press, and I got out of there. When you look back on it, really, um, even though it wasn't the AFC championship game and three times the Browns would advance to the AFC championship game, I think most Browns fans would agree that that was the closest team that the Browns ever assembled in the Super Bowl era to being a Super Bowl champion caliber team? There was, there was, see, the one thing that I have learned, and it, and it follows me both in business and in uh, uh, raising kids, <laughs> um, <laughs> there's a certain amount of uh, love and, um, I guess you call it opportunity that comes with a, a team, an organized team, especially in the sports realm. Uh, and there's an intangible uh, feeling of success that you already have. That team had, I, I, I did not play on another Browns team that had all of those intangible feelings that we had on that team. We went into every game knowing that as long as we stay close, regardless, somehow or another, we were gonna win the game at the end of the game. And we won, I think, five or six like that, right? We won five or six games where we were losing and then ended up winning at the end. That team was, you know, you would call it karma, you would call it, uh, I don't know what you would call it, but that team had it. And it was the only time that I had that on, that, on, on a football team. So was it bitter irony then that the cardiac kids actually saw their run end on a day when that spark didn't happen? That, I guess you would call it irony because we were better than that Oakland team. Um, we, we should have won that game. Um, we didn't probably play our best game, but that, see, and that's also the key. The ability to be able to overcome problems during a game when you're not playing the best is one of the best ways a team develops camaraderie and, and yeah, very true. success, right? And that team had that. I remember Guys coming off the field and the offense coming to me and say, all right, Tom, you got to get an interception. Uh, I remember <laughs> them saying to uh, uh, Lyle Alzado or whomever, you got to get a sack. I mean, they, they all, we always said, we always felt that we had the ability to turn a game based on somebody doing something extraordinary. 
Tom, what does it mean to you that you still hold the Browns' career interception record? We've had some pretty good defensive backs come through here. We've had some great defensive backs. Uh, one, I think it means guys don't know how to catch balls. Right? <laughs> <laughs> In the second, you know, they used to say the only reason you're playing a defensive back is because you couldn't be a receiver, right? You didn't have the so, hands to be a receiver. Yeah, that's right. But uh, no, it's a tremendous honor, and it was something that. Uh, and I hate to I hate to admit this, right? Because my ideology changed over time from Michigan to Cleveland, where and I think that happens when you become a pro. Uh, you start thinking more about individual honors because those are important to you for a lot of reasons. One. Uh, helping the team win games, two, contract negotiations, extra perks that you get in your contract for making individual honors. Right. All of those things become important. Where in college, the individual honors weren't important at all. Right. Because right. there was really no benefit to you individually to become an All-Big Ten or, or even making an All-American team. Although sure. I got some pretty nice trophies and and – some hardware and even some clothes, some clothing that I still have from uh, my uh, Michigan days, uh, especially all American banquet stuff, you know, but. Right. Um, Very nice. Tom, when, um, when the run was coming to an end for you, how did you know that it was time to leave the football in, in, in your past? All right. That would, I didn't want to accept it, but it was obvious. Um, the first of all, the physical toll that playing in the National Football League takes on your body is immense. I was 198 pounds, 204 somewhere in between of most of my years, um, and you know, as I as I gained more. Uh, years of experience, the defense, I mean, the running backs got bigger, the quarterbacks got bigger, the wide receivers got bigger. Uh, so the speed and the collisions became greater because the faster you are, the bigger you are, the more, the more impact those collisions have on your body. And 19, 1980 or was it 81? I can't remember. Either my the year after I made my last All Pro season, uh, I had a, a lower back problem, and uh, some of the people thought that it was psychosomatic, <laughs> uh, but I knew. I mean, it, my it would actually lock up on me so that I couldn't lift my leg. And as you know, Jay, if you can't lift your leg, you can't run. So, and I, and, and, and I remember this vividly because we're playing the Steelers and I have my leg bandaged up and Rocky Bly, who was a, a hard-nosed guy and running back, and I don't know Rocky, but from what I hear, he's a pretty decent guy, outran me to the end zone, and he was a slow running back, right? And I knew then something was, you know, if I can't outrun him to the end zone, something's wrong. But, but most of us, most of us, for the love of the game, and more so for the love of the game, I think, and for your contract, have a hard time accepting the reality of when to stop. Right. But my body was telling me in the my ninth year that I should have not have been playing in the National Football League. I imagine you had your share of collisions with Earl Campbell and with Franco Harris and some pretty bruising backs. I had at one time the uh, unmistakable duty of bringing down, I think, seven of the top ten running backs in the history of the National Football League. Wow. And one in particular, Larry Zonka, was just, I mean, it was just like a battering ram trying to bring that guy down. 
Uh, Franco yeah. Harris. He was faster than a lot of guys, but he was big. And when he would, and he didn't like being hit, and he didn't like delivering, but when he had to, he would. And he would lower his shoulder, and, oh, man, he was hard to bring down. Earl Campbell. You just didn't bring Earl Campbell down by yourself, except yeah. for Jack Tatum. Jack Tatum was the only guy I knew that could hit Earl Campbell and <laughs> knock him backwards, you know? Uh, yeah. Other than that, it took a village. It did. So, so I mean, Tom, every week there was somebody like that. Before we go, I want to ask about your – after football life years, what have you been up to and how do you spend your time now? I became a financial advisor in Cleveland, spent years uh, actually representing players uh, through our financial advising company. Um, actually, by the fifth year of working for a company in Cleveland and there were some issues with the uh, uh, hierarchy. I had to find a place to park my license. So I came to Iowa, uh, introduced to Agon USA Securities, and parked my license with Agon USA Securities. Represented players until about 1995. Mm -hmm. 95, I opened up my own business and left Agon USA Securities. And I've been in my own business ever since. Um, I, I used to do some uh, real estate investments. Um, now I do uh, banking uh, bonds and issues from banks that we sell to clients uh, privately. So I'm in the secondary market uh, doing that now. Um, and most of the time I spend my day on the phone with bond market people, clients. And when I get tired of that, I play with my granddaughter. I uh, <laughs> work out my grandson. I uh, work out myself. Um, or I just go and uh, bug my wife at her office. <laughs> it, sounds as if, my day is. it sounds as if you've had as much success in your post football life as you had in your playing days. When you look back at your time in Cleveland, how do you characterize your years with the Browns? Those were great years for me, only from the perspective that um, I loved Cleveland. Uh, I loved the east side of Cleveland. I love the West Side of Cleveland. And at that time, there was a division between the East and the West. Sure. Um, I spent a lot of time trying to gain access to break down some of those barriers between the East and the West. Uh, personally, I tried to be, probably created some barriers between the East <laughs> and the West. But um, I felt like I was a part of the Cleveland um, Cleveland life, Cleveland sure. city. Um, so I enjoyed my time in Cleveland. Um, I still come back because I have a daughter who is an attorney in Cleveland. Uh, I still have relatives in Cleveland. Um, I'm in Sandusky quite a bit. Um, sometimes I get up that far east sometimes i don't but uh, i characterize my time in cleveland as unfinished only because i never won a championship in cleveland uh, i should have won a championship in cleveland had a good enough team surrounding me and talent wise to win a championship in cleveland it just didn't occur um, and to be honest with you, I still think about that sometimes, but I know that we did the best that we could during my time there. And I made, I got great friends that I made on that team that we still keep in contact with one another. I learned a lot, developed as a, as a human being from my experiences and some of the things that I worked on while I was in Cleveland. Uh, so it, it really helped me 
you know, in my in my growth. So Cleveland is has a big part of my uh, big part of my heart. You were always a fan favorite, and for eight Sundays a year for almost a decade, you heard the fans' adoration for you each time you stepped on the field, and you know how we feel about you. I'd like to give you an opportunity to give a message to Browns fans, what they've meant to you. Browns fans, <laughs> you took a young uh, Ohio kid from a small town and you really supported him through his growing pains. You helped him become a man. You saw the good and the bad of him and accepted him. So I thank you for that. And you always were there when we needed you on the playing field, whether we were a 10 and four team or a four and 10 team. And that is probably even more important to me because your, your love never wavered. You always constantly uplifted the Cleveland Browns. You constantly treated us like we were family. You showed me how people in this country are supposed to love, not only as sports teams, but as uh, fans and players. So I thank you from the bottom of my heart, and I think you are still the best fans in the National Football League. We're a loyal bunch, and I second that. Tom, I want to thank you so much for the time that you've given us. I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I'm sure our audience has really enjoyed hearing some of your stories and catching up with you and what you're up to today. Thank you so much again for, for making so much time for us. Jay, thank you, man. You made my day, and uh, I'm glad to see another Sandusky and doing well, and it's <laughs> a pleasure. So good luck to you. Tom, thank you again, and thank you at home for watching another episode of Club 46, driven by Bridgestone. We're back again with another former or current all-time great Cleveland Brown when we speak again. For Tom Darden, I'm Jay Crawford. We'll see you soon.